Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you start enjoying what you are hearing, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and tickle that bell and set it to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of the channel or would like to gift me a coffee, the information can be found down in the description box. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Hey guys, hopefully this makes sense to most. It might be all over the place, but I'm still shaken from this. This guy that I'll name Kay and I had a thing, long distance relationship for a couple of months until I broke up with him. After we broke up, he would message me constantly about how he messed up and to give him another chance. Since he kept on harassing me, I changed my numbers, but I could still see he was stalking me on my Call of Duty mobile profile, which I can see whenever he clicked on my profile. I am used to seeing him do that, so it's not so surprising, but as long as he wasn't talking to me, that was fine. He could do things to get my attention, like making TikTok accounts to try to talk to me, which later I deleted. He even started texting my family members to get my attention. Until today, I got a random text message from this unknown number, and I stupidly decided to respond, thinking I would know this person. This person claimed to know me and said they saw me go into a certain class, which was exactly what I did today, and they also knew what class I'm in. Well, at least one of them. They claimed to have found my number from my sister, and when I asked her, she said she would never give my number out to anyone, which I believe her because she knows what Kay has done, and how he won't leave me alone. He claimed to be a certain person and even gave a name, but I don't know anyone by that name. I thought this was a sick joke from someone, so I even responded sarcastically to some of the messages until this person mentioned Kay's name. Then I knew this must be him, but that would mean he is watching me and in my school. Do you guys think I'm overthinking it and this is just a coincidence or should I feel this way and do something serious about it? Hello, I have to tell you that I'm not an English native, so forgive my wording. It happened six years ago when I was 20. So I came home after sleeping at my boyfriend's place. It was like 8 a.m., super early because my boyfriend started his shift and my parents were already gone like an hour earlier to their holidays. So I was alone at home and I knew it. So I came home and I went directly to my bedroom to continue my night before climbing the stairs. There's two floors. I saw the kitchen door window wide open. I was surprised, but I didn't think that I was in any danger inside my own home. You have to know that my father is super paranoid and there's no way he could have forgotten to close the windows before leaving the house, at least for two weeks. Even if I stayed because I used to sleep at my boyfriend's house most of the time, but I was barely awake, so I just closed the door. I checked the kitchen and the living room just to be sure, and then get up to my room. There's three rooms on the second floor. I went to my room, changed, then went to the bathroom and get back to my room. I did close the door of my room 
and I don't know why, because I never did. I was scrolling on my phone, and like five minutes later, I heard footsteps right behind my door. Someone was there the whole time, especially while I was just going about my business and felt vulnerable. I was terrified. My heart stopped. I couldn't move. I just took the first thing in front of me to defend myself, my babyless. I stared at my door, waiting for the person to open up and kill me, or worse. I was ready to jump out of the window and die if I had to see the door open. Minutes passed, and I heard the person on the stairs. I don't know how long I stayed there, immobile, but eventually I called my boyfriend and he came to rescue me. At first, I thought I was crazy because I didn't see anything and I couldn't believe that it really happened. But my boyfriend confirmed that they forced the door and windows to the kitchen, so they really were here. They were silently waiting for me to sleep to get out of my house. I was home alone, feeling safe, but I was not now. It was traumatic. I can't barely stay alone somewhere without freaking out today. I live alone and am constantly afraid that someone is trying to break in. But the worst part is that they didn't look for anything. My mom's MacBook and jewelry, my PS4, my dad's gaming setup. Everything was so easy to take, but they didn't touch it. I can't stop thinking that they were here for another reason. You have to know that, at that time, I was very active on Snapchat. I used to post every day. I used to tell and put on my story every part of my day. So the 5,000 of unknown followers that I had on social media knew everything about me at this time. And I think it might be related. Since then, I stopped my activities on Snapchat. Do you think it's related, or did I just interrupt them? This is quite long, but worth listening to, in my opinion, that is. I've had my fair share of weird and creepy encounters in my life, but... This story is one of the two that have never truly left me frightened for any extended period of time. This is the story of John, my childhood stalker. I'm a 20-year-old female for content's sake, by the way. When I was a child, my mother and stepdad owned their own maintenance company. We lived out in the middle of nowhere in the South. All the neighboring towns were very small, and everyone knew everyone. Because of this, there has always been a heightened sense of trust amongst the community. Every so often, my mom and stepdad would get a job that was just too much for them to accomplish on their own. When that happened, they would hire local boys, usually from the high school and community college, to help out. Again, we lived in a very small town that still very much believed in Southern hospitality. So, it wasn't all that unusual for these boys to be invited over for dinner with my family. Enter John. John was in his mid-twenties and had only recently moved to our town from New York City. John was a bit awkward, but he was a very hard worker and, at first, came across as a very kind-hearted person. I was 11 when John started working for my family. He would come and join us for meals after working for my family all day. My big sister, who was just a few years younger than John, had recently moved out west and I missed her a lot. So, when John began to show interest in me, I was very excited. Look at that. Now I have a big brother figure who thinks my middle school drama is interesting to listen to over dinner. My family liked John and hired him on for the next few jobs they got. John continued to be very friendly toward me, but I and my family always interrupted it as someone who wanted to be nice to me. September rolls around, 
John has worked for my family for a couple of months by now. My birthday is coming up, and my family promises to take me bowling. An hour's drive away, so it was a big deal for me. They tell me this when John is around, and somehow John ends up inviting himself. I remember thinking it was kind of weird, but John had always been nice, and I didn't want to be rude and say that I didn't want him around. My family was also heavily involved in the local fire department. Every year, we would volunteer to do this haunted hayride event, where basically people would dress up like monsters and go out into the woods and scare the guests that came through, with all the money going to the fire department. The event was scheduled to start in two weeks after my birthday. My mom mentions it to John, and he says that he's really interested in it. And could he help out? My mom, bless her heart, is the sweetest little southern lady and says of course he can. She'll put him in contact with the man who runs it. Well, John ends up doing it, and plot twist ends up being put in the same area as my family and I because he apparently didn't want to work with strangers. Um, okay. This is when things started getting weird. Mind you, this event required us working long, late hours out in the woods. In the beginning of the season, there would sometimes be long gaps between groups. The first weekend, we had a gap like that. A boy I was friends with was working the next station over and I told my mom I was going to go say hi to him. I took the path through the woods so in case a group came by, they wouldn't see a small preteen girl covered in fake blood skipping through the woods, because that's hardly scary. As I was walking, I hear something and turn around. There's John. I ask him what he's doing, and he said he saw me leave and didn't want me to get hurt. I tell him I'm fine and that my mom knows where I'm going and that these woods are very safe. The most dangerous animal here is deer. He says he doesn't feel comfortable with me walking by myself and grabs my arm. This freaked me out and I pulled it away and said I was just going to go back to our station. The rest of the run, John also managed to show up whenever I was alone to talk to me. I never mentioned this to my mom because I still felt like my dislike for John was rude. My family liked him, so surely I should too. Fast forward to February. John hasn't been around much because most of the work hasn't required him. Then, on Valentine's Day, I get home and see a vase of red roses in the kitchen. I ask my mom if my stepdad gave them to her. She says no. She hands me the card. It says something along the lines of, My name was right here. You're the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. I love you. My mom asks me if there were any boys at school who would send me something like this. I tell her no. We exchange carnations at school, and I had never had a boy interested in me. The next week, John swings by, not all that unusual. While he's there, he asks me if I like my roses. I play dumb and ask him what flowers, which upset him. I told my mom, and she was pretty pissed, and asked him what exactly was he playing at. He insisted it was just a friendly gesture, and he hadn't meant anything by it. He just thought... A pretty girl deserved roses on Valentine's Day. My mom told him to never pull shit like that again. Cute April. Mysterious bouquets of flowers started getting delivered weekly, then almost daily. My mom knows it must be John. She calls him and tells him to cut it out and that he's not welcome anymore. My family had a desktop in a room that had several windows. One evening, I was downstairs dinking around on the computer when I hear a tap on the window and look out. And there's John standing on our porch. 
smiling this really creepy smile. I get up and poke my head out the door and tell him that my mom doesn't want him coming around. He says he just wants to talk to me. Being a dumb 12 year old, I step out on the porch. He then proceeds to tell me that he wants to wait for me, that I'm the most beautiful woman he knows and that he loves me, but that he knows I'm young so he's willing to wait a few years. I make up some excuse to go back in the house and get my mom. I'm crying at this point. Well, my mom and stepdad go downstairs and tell him that they will shoot his ass if he does not get his ass off of their property right now. He gets pissed and says they're trying to deny us our love. What the fuck? My stepdad says he's serious about getting the gun, so John eventually leaves, but says that they can't keep him away from me. We go to the cops. We get a restraining order. Remember the whole small town part? Well, turns out small towns don't take well to grown-ass men who harass little girls. John essentially gets driven out of town and goes back to New York City. I think that's the end of it. Then, the phone calls start. He would call from prepaid phones and pay phones, so the numbers were never consistent. My mom forbid me from answering the phone unless I knew who it was. Before, I would always answer unknown numbers if I was home alone because our home phone was also the work phone, so it was usually clients. My mom didn't tell me until much later that the calls were getting continuously more violent and sexual in nature. We would always call the cops, but very little was done. Then things stopped. It seemed like everything was over. I started high school and soon forgot all about Creepy John. Boys my own age began to like me and everything seemed to be normal. Until the end of my senior year of high school, a letter came addressed to me, and inside was a horribly graphic letter talking about how I was old enough for him to come back. I was 16, by the way, and that I had better dump my loser boyfriend because it was time for him to come back in my life. That he knew I wanted him, and he would do whatever it took to make sure we were reunited. The cops were called again, and my school was informed. I only had a month left of term and spent the last month with my teachers watching me like a hawk. My mom insisted on coming to pick me up every day. I didn't have my own car then. And I wasn't allowed to leave with anyone else. We get a call from the cops a few weeks later telling us that John had been arrested for unrelated charges, but that they can't disclose more than that. I thought that would be the end of it. Since I graduated so young, I didn't leave for university until the next year. 17 about to turn 18. I moved a few hours away and landed a pretty sweet acting gig the fall I moved. Then, in October, two scary things happened in one week. Another letter arrived at my mom's house, just as scary and threatening as the first. Then, at my job, which largely involved a lot of audience interaction. A lady handed me a note at the end of the run. I was confused but kept it, only to open it in the dressing room. It was addressed to me, using my full name, inviting me to meet up with her and her friend. We didn't have programs that listed names and I had never seen her before. I had no clue if that was related at all to John, but Given that he had just made contact again, I was incredibly shaken by it. I haven't heard from him since. I've moved again since that last letter. I don't know if he's still in jail. I certainly hope so. I just hope that, as traumatic as all of that was for me, he never pursued or, heaven forbid, attacked any other young girls.
I've tried to type out my story numerous times, but always struggled to wade through the pieces as they've gotten more and more jumbled and foggy with time. I can't say I was traumatized by what happened. I'm not sure if it makes me a fucked up person, but I typically tell the story at parties to manipulate drunk acquaintances into thinking I've survived something cool. So, let's get into it. In 2015, I was 19 and working for the summer at a Bible camp for inner city kids. I'm going to leave out the city name, but just know that obviously crime occurs frequently in big cities, and this one was no different. I had been assured that this neighborhood, however, was in the process of being gentrified, and they had even just opened up a hipster coffee shop dog park right down the street. Just to give you a really clear visual, this neighborhood had dilapidated houses with trash out in the front, right next to the houses with immaculate yards and square modern architecture. The Bible camp where I was working was essentially just a huge two-story house with a large fenced-in yard. Again, we were assured that we were safe, though, because we had bars on the windows and the outer doors locked automatically when they shut. The camp was conducted downstairs, and the summer counselors, there were about four of us, lived in the small upstairs that was off-limits during the day to the kids. Our camp ran five days a week, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then time was ours to explore the city or rest or whatever. Probably enough to get to the story now. I love a good setting, and it could be important later. One weekend night in July, we were all just hanging out in the house making spaghetti for dinner. We each got our own stipend for food, so we divided it accordingly for meals, then brought our own snacks and shit. We were also in charge of preparing lunch and snacks for the kids on camp days, so we had two refrigerators and two pantries. As you can probably guess, we labeled them Camp Fridge and Pantry, and one is labeled Staff Fridge and Pantry. We also were super fucking petty and wrote our names all over our snacks in the fridge. My best friend worked at the camp with me. We will just call her Chris. And it was our turn to cook that night. So I went into the staff fridge and grabbed the ground beef. I immediately noticed that my case of Gogurt is gone. They were my go-to snacks and I brought like three cases a week. I had just opened my last box like an hour before to have one and left it in front of the ground beef. It sounds crazy, but I know I did. I closed the fridge door and head to the dining room, Chris closely watching me and yell at everyone else, who stole all the fucking gogurt? That night, in addition to Chris and myself, there were the two other summer counselors two permanent counselors that lived in the area and then the cousin of one of the permanent counselors. Everyone looked at me wide-eyed, then looked around blankly. I figured it was the cousin because I had never met her before, so I sucked it up and said, whatever, just if it has my name on it, please don't eat it. Then pulled Chris back into the kitchen to finish up the spaghetti. We all eat dinner, and then the two permanent counselors volunteered to do the dishes because we let them eat with us. The rest of us headed back upstairs to get comfy in the sitting room on the couches and turn on Family Guy. We're only like two minutes in when the cousin, we'll just call her Sarah, says, Wait, I can't find my phone or wallet. I pause the show and roll my eyes, still annoyed about the gogurt. Chris says, where did you last leave them? And Sarah says she left them on the couch before we went downstairs to dinner. Naturally, we all start looking around the small room, turning over couch cushions, looking under the couches, behind them, under blankets, really wherever. Finally, we were all like, are you sure you didn't leave them downstairs? She agrees to head downstairs to look with the other two 
and Chris and I go into our room, which is connected to the sitting room. We flopped down on the bottom of our bunk bed, and I proceeded to talk shit about Sarah, who I feel like is ruining our chill-out night. Our door is open, and I'm shocked when I see a hand kind of sneak into view, like it's going to grab the door frame. I say, hey, did you find them? Thinking that Sarah or the other two have somehow made it back upstairs without me hearing them, and have heard me talk shit for the past five minutes. But the hand immediately disappears out of the door frame, and there's no response. I look at Chris like, what the fuck? And she's looking back at me confused because she never saw the hand. I quickly explain what happened, and then we both jump up and head to the top of the stairs. We yell down for the others, and they yell back, that they haven't found them yet. By this point, I'm freaked the fuck out because who was up here with us? Of course, we're those people though, and we start looking around upstairs in our bedroom, and the other bedroom, and in the sitting room. We find nothing, and no one. We decide not to say anything yet because I might sound insane, and also, how could someone have gotten downstairs so fast without us hearing them? When we got downstairs, Sarah is super upset and crying. Her cousin says, Come on, guys. Did someone take our stuff? But Chris and I know we didn't, and we say so. Sarah screams that obviously someone took them, and we should just be honest, and then things got heated. I finally decide to tell them about the hand because I feel like it will maybe reduce the tension between us. It does, but then everyone panics. We run around the house like maniacs, looking in every closet or hiding place the kids use, and find nothing and no one. We ended up calling our camp director to come over because the situation has just evolved into chaos. When he gets there, we're all sitting, huddled in the foyer, freaked out, and we explain what we can. He just doesn't seem convinced that someone was in the house and threatens to call the cops. If one of us doesn't give Sarah back her things, well, none of us fess up, so he calls the cops, and they come over and search the property and take our statements. It seems so dumb as we repeat our stories, but we didn't have much to go off of but a feeling. They do write a report, for stolen property, and that makes Sarah feel a little bit better at least. With the house secure, everyone leaves except us four summer counselors who live there. We spend the night in the same room with the door barricaded, reassuring ourselves that we're being stupid and the phone and wallet will actually turn up somewhere random and we will laugh about it. Fast forward a few days. We've relaxed a bit. We haven't found Sarah's things like we expected, but nothing else weird has happened, and we've been occupied with the kids and the job in general. The kids have all gone home at this point, and it's just the four of us again at the house. We finish cleaning up outside, lock the gate, and head in the dining room door. We're all hungry and want snacks. Chris gets to the kitchen first and says, Someone left the kitchen door open again. I mean, it's kind of weird, but kids go in and out that door all day. So, of all doors to be open, this is the least weird. She shuts it, and then I notice that the staff fridge door is also cracked open. Then, who knows what possessed me, but I go, Oh no, y'all, he's back. We all laugh because we think this is ridiculous. Chris grabs a broom, holds it as a weapon, and says, Let's get him, girls. She starts to throw open the pantry doors, screaming, Where the fuck are you, motherfucker? And, We know you're in here. Show yourself. I'm following behind her laughing, but I start to explicitly feel uneasy and nervous. She continues her charade into the next room, throwing open two more closet doors. Then, 
moves into the front room and opens that closet door. She starts another confident. We know you're... When she stops mid-sentence and screams so loudly, skin on my neck prickles. Then she throws the broom in the closet and sprints out the front door, leaving it open. My heart is pounding so fucking hard at this point, but I'm thinking she's just messing with us. So I turn around and go the other way, into the foyer and out the front door. I see her booking it down the street towards the coffee shop, and I'm like, Okay, what is she doing? As soon as I turn back around to find the others, he's just there. Older man, looks really dirty, has hardly any teeth. He's just grinning at me. He has his hands up and says, I didn't mean no harm, while slowly backing away down the street in the other direction. It's so creepy because even though he says this, it's like he doesn't mean it. It's like his tone and the grin are mocking me. I'm frozen for a second and then I sputter out. Uh, you can't just, um, leave? And he just says again with that goddamn grin. I didn't mean no harm. Then turns and runs. I fumble in my pocket for my phone and dial 911, then go to follow him, but as soon as I reach the edge of the house, he's gone. Next events are kind of a blur. Sounds wild, but we really all thought we just freaked ourselves out. No way in hell did we actually think someone was in the house. The cops took our statements and reminded us that we needed to keep the doors shut at all times, no matter what. Our director apologized profusely for not initially believing us. My parents wanted me to come back home for the remainder of the summer, but I was like, eh, what else could happen? Chris was the one who had it the worst. She was terrified to stay in that house. She told me later that then she opened the door he was grinning at her with dead eyes, like he was waiting for her to finally find him. She said she will never forget his face. We're still best friends at almost 30, and I can't bring up that summer to her if she hasn't been drinking. That's basically it. I think what kept me up at night after that were just unanswered questions. Like, how long had he been in the house? Why did he randomly decide to take the phone and wallet of the one person who didn't work there? Had he listened to our private conversations? Watched us getting dressed or even worse, shower? How much food had he stolen that we didn't notice? Where the fuck had he gone when we were looking for him on spaghetti night? What hiding places did we miss? Was he under the bed at night, or at any point during my stay? I don't know. All of these answers, and I know I'll never have them, but I'm thankful our interaction wasn't worse, I guess. So, creepy, grinning squatter who lived among us for God knows how long. Let's not ever meet again. Hello everyone, I'm not looking for advice, I just want to share my story. Many years back, I dated a man-child relatively the same age as myself. We got along quite well. He presented gentlemanly, hospitable, kind, and loving. In hindsight, things escalated quite quickly. We went from being friends to being exclusive within a month. Not enough time to truly know someone. This story is quite lengthy. I'll do my best to shorten it without leaving out integral details. We saw each other daily. We mostly hung out at his home. That was fine with me in the beginning, as I'm rather introverted. A couple months into our relationship, I started to ask why we weren't leaving the house. Why weren't we going out and experiencing new things and trying out new hobbies. His responses were always cloudy, 
He always tried to redirect the conversation, thinking I was truly stupid and couldn't tell that this was an obvious avoidance tactic. This was the point where I started to become curious, and from there it went downhill. I'm not an intrusive person, but considering he was my partner, I had a right to inquire as to why we were isolating ourselves. After some mild questioning for a few weeks, I noticed he began to create distance. This notable change was hard to ignore and pretty much confirmed my suspicions. However, I'm not going to make a decision based on assumptions. I'm ashamed to admit this, but one night while he was sleeping, I went through his phone. I still feel disgusting even though I found 100% proof that I was the side chick. I could not believe it. I still can't believe it. I was with this person daily. It obviously confirmed why we were so confined to his home. But it was perplexing because she had no idea about me. It was about 2 a.m. when I looked through his phone. There was no way I could sleep beside him for the remainder of the morning. So, I quietly got out of bed, collected my things, and went home. The next day, I believe he realized what had happened. However, he never contacted me to see why I left. Things remained silent for the rest of the day. And then, I received a phone call later that evening. I confronted him. Again, I'm ashamed to say that I did take photos of the evidence, as I knew he would try to gaslight me. The fury in his voice was palpable. He did what a usual abuser would do, and blame me for going through his phone, while totally ignoring his infidelity. It was utterly pathetic. He had created this delusion that I was going to contact the other girlfriend and tell her all his wrongdoings, all his infidelity, lying, cheating, etc. I would have done this, however, while I was looking through the phone, I realized that this girl was very sheltered. She was completely oblivious to what was going on. I was afraid that he would retaliate against myself and her, and I thought to myself that eventually she would find out. I do regret not informing her. However, my decision was my decision and I cannot change that. This is where my nightmare begins. He was so paranoid and confident that I was going to contact his girlfriend that he would constantly call me daily and make vague threats against me. I persistently advised him that I would not contact her, that it was none of my business, that she would eventually find out that he was a deceitful, inept brain worm sooner or later. All I wanted was for him to fuck off and leave me alone and never speak with me again. That was my only request. He obviously didn't take my kind words well and he continued to harass me. Only a few days later, things completely erupted. His paranoia exceeded levels I have never seen before. He sent me threatening messages with the context being, I have compromising photos of you, and I will release them. As he believed that I would ruin his relationship, I couldn't believe the delusion no matter what I said, no matter how I phrased it. I even had my mom speak with him at one point, but it was useless. I sent him a message stating that if this was true, and if he messaged me again, I'm going to call the cops. Five minutes later, I received 11 messages in succession, a few more videos, photos, and personalized animations of myself. I had never seen these images or videos and animations before. These were taken without my consent. These were extremely intimate and compromising. Unbeknownst to me, he had cameras set up around his room. These weren't just threats. These were screenshots of these images, videos, and animations 
uploaded on various sharing sites. Luckily, he lacked intelligence. He sent me the evidence. There was nothing I could do to stop the uploads. I immediately went to the police. They did manage to take some down. However, there were no promises as once a photo was uploaded, it could be immediately archived. This has forever altered my life. I don't see your relationships the same. I can't be intimate. I can't form strong bonds. I've become apathetic. I'm forensically observant. I have difficulty trusting everyone, even my family, and so much more. In conclusion, the police were rather efficient and treated me well. I was granted an immediate protection order, family violence order. He broke that quite quickly and called my phone, trying his best to apologize, begging to drop the charges. He's so pathetic that he got his mommy to ring me and tried to persuade me. I immediately called the police and they took immediate action. This ended up going to court. I won. It's not the result that I wanted. However, he did get his name on that good old sex offenders registry, which is far more egregious than people may think. Nevertheless, this is beyond life-changing. To all who have gone through this, I'm sorry, and I feel your pain. Cheers for listening to my story. I know it was long, but I hope it was a good story. Be careful around the people who you think you trust. I know that's quite nihilistic and pessimistic. These are some of the unfortunate aspects of life. It's quite paradoxical. Humans are social creatures, but many humans are pure rat shit. This is a real story that's happening now, but this all really started on my birthday. I did speak with an authority about these instances, but am open to hearing your takes as well. It's been pretty frightening. Here's a quick backstory. I live with a female roommate, Julia, and her boyfriend. About a year ago, Julia and I started going to hangout spots and met a woman working there around our age, Sam. Julia and I stopped going after a while, but I stayed friends with Sam. Not super close, but seeing her once, you know, every couple of weeks. She supported my business, brought me small gifts, and invited me places over the course of the year. I enjoyed being friends with her. On my birthday, Sam and other friends posted my photo on social media. That's when I get a message from an account I don't know, asking me to message them back and discuss a film opportunity. Half curious, I respond. They say a bunch of stuff, and to finally come out and say that they are casting adult film stars. They quote me a large amount of money. He says it's very private. Porn sold overseas. No one will ever see it. I declined politely, honestly chuckled. By the way, they are not Googleable. There's nothing on their social page or anything about their production company online. The person messaging insists I text their female reference. Curiosity gets the best of me because I do just that. Female reference weirds me out. She's normal at first, but seems too excited about the actual job. She's encouraging me to do my casting with the person I've messaged and saying I'm very lucky he's even offered. He's only offered that to a few girls. I'm thinking, no woman in porn really feels this excited or happy or satisfied with all that. I'm weirded out and she's blocked. He messages me to ask if we talk. I say yes, but decline again, and he's blocked now too. I'm embarrassed I even considered. But then, a couple days later, my roommate shows me a weird text to her personal phone number. 
It's the same people offering the same thing. They say, though, we found you on a list. You must have signed up. I'm sure my roommate did no such thing. I'll say here, not many people know both me and my roommate. I tell my roommate what happened to me. We are both just confused. For the next four months or so, I get text messages. All different kinds, all eventually saying, yes, this is not Googleable, adult film company here, and we are so sorry about the mix-up. I answer some nice, I answer some mean, I ignore others completely. They never ask for photos, info, anything really, except to consider the offer, and maybe come for a drink to discuss in person. That was it until yesterday. Sam sends me a message on social media. It's a group chat with a profile I've never seen, plus Sam, plus my business profile. I do creative team building work. Sam wants to introduce me to her friend Dave. Dave needs to hire a team builder at a fancy hotel about an hour away from me. Sam makes the introduction. I say thank you, and then Sam leaves the group chat. Dave's profile is empty. She messages me privately and says basically, I used to casually see this guy. He's good for the job. He's pretty wealthy, and I know he owns, like, multiple businesses. He used to be in adult film productions, but I think he's been done with that. And this would be for a different business that he has. Other than that, he's a normal dude. I messaged the man back and asked, what's the company and can I have a website or some pages or something? Any more info? He says, well, he will launch the website at the event I'm being hired for and that he just bought the company and it's being branded. But Sam is messaging me too. She says he is selling the business and this two day hotel event is for their farewell party. She suggests I bring my boyfriend since it would be an all-expense-paid stay. Also, she mentions she's going to visit this old friend tonight to try to catch up over drinks. She said she hasn't seen him in a long time. All right, this is weird as hell. The guy is messaging me along the lines of, Sorry, I know this is weird. Feel free to bring your boyfriend. Uh, what? And he also mentions how he was seeing my friend tonight. I leave him on red until the morning. I send him the original weird adult film account and say, This you? They say nope. And I say yeah, okay. They respond thumbs up and leave the chat. I had mentioned to Sam months ago about the weird offer and text messages I got. She too said she got bizarre messages in the past. They only stopped when she said she would call the police. She didn't offer more details, but was driving, so I didn't push it. So now I message Sam, and I say straight up, Sam, I think this is the person that has been harassing me from different numbers. She acts weirded out and surprised, asks about the original account that messaged me. Eventually, she closes the conversation and goes to bed. I left her on red. I don't answer her call the next day, and she texts me. Um, that was weird last night. Call me if you want to chat because I'm so confused. I don't respond. Today, she texts me. Um, okay. I wrote her back, basically saying, listen, you know I've been weirded out about this. And I've been wondering if someone is trying to abduct me and now wondering if you're involved, either innocently or not. It's too much for me. She wrote me back saying more or less she understands that it was a scary, weird experience, but she thinks I'm way overreacting and basically she seems offended that I even could think such a thing. She also said... She wouldn't want to ever speak with someone again who could think that about her. She left it with that, 
She lives her life on the straight path and can't let someone try and drag her into something like that. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can use a free website online to insert photos of someone and it will generate pages on the internet that match based on facial recognition. When I began having this fear of her involvement, I searched her and found what I am 99.9% .9 sure was thumbnails of her in an adult film, either her or her spitting image, as it also pulled known photos of her as well. I didn't say this to her, of course. I know, she knows. But that last statement she gave me is extra weird, knowing all of that. So, that's my story. Hopefully, they didn't get me. I'm not the one to be played with. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klemko, Anita B, Doba Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. As always, thank you all for being the pillar of support for Back to Ashes. And the other subscribers or just listeners, thank you all so much for supporting this channel. I look forward in the future to see how much larger we can grow. With that being said, if you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.